Hello, and welcome to the virtual AWP Conference and Book Fair. I'm January Gill O'Neill, the Vice Chair of the AWP Board of Directors. For accessibility, I'd like to offer a physical description of myself. I'm a black woman with short hair. I'm wearing a green and blue blouse and gold hoop earrings, and I look amazing. We are delighted to bring you this event today. Before we introduce our featured presenters, I'd like to acknowledge and thank the sponsor of today's event, Cave Canem, an organization that's close to my heart. Our literary partners and sponsors allow AWP to present these extraordinary literary events and help keep our conference affordable and accessible. A thank you to all of our conference sponsors and partners for their support and participation. This event is taking place live on March 7th from 6.30, 7.30 Central Time. After the conclusion of the event, it will be available for on-demand viewing. This event is being live captioned through Stream Text. Please find the link access to Stream Text from your browser in the event description. A transcript of the event will be available for on-demand viewing. During this live event, please enter your questions or comments into the platform chat box on the right of the screen. Time permitting, there will be a brief Q&A where the moderator will take questions from the platform chat. If you are watching on demand, feel free to continue to leave comments in the chat box to the right of the video. We thank you so much for attending and for your continued support of AWP. We hope you have enjoyed this event. Hello everyone, I'm Jari Bradley, a Kavi Kanem Fellow and tonight's moderator. Kavi Kanem is North America's premier home for Black poetry. We're delighted you can join us this evening. Please follow the organization at Kavi Kanem Poets on social media and visit their website to sign up for the monthly newsletter and learn about upcoming events, workshops, and book contest submissions. Established in 2001, Kaveh Kanem's Legacy Conversations features preeminent poets and scholars who have played historic roles in Black poetry. These discussions address historical, aesthetic, political, and personal influences on craft and thought. This edition features C.S. Giscom, known for his meditations across geography and time, and Nathaniel Mackey, noted for his experiments with language and music. A brief Q&A will follow, so please submit questions via that function at the bottom of your screen. Again, my name is Jari Bradley. I'm a Black gender queer poet and scholar from San Francisco, California. I've received fellowships and support from Kalalu, Kaveh Kanem, Tin House, the Pittsburgh Foundation, and the Heinz Endowments. My work has been published in the Adroit Journal, Blood Orange Review, The Offing, Academy of American Poets, Poem A Day, Kalalu, Columbia Journal, the Virginia Quarterly Review, and elsewhere. I received an MFA from the University of Pittsburgh, and I'm currently serving as the 2021 First Wave Poetry Fellow here at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. C.S. Giscom is the author of several collections of poetry, including Prairie Style, Giscom Road, and Here. He has also written prose in such works as Into and Out of This Location, Border Towns, and Ohio Railroads, a poem in essay form. Giscom is the recipient of the Stephen Henderson Award, the American Book Award, and the Carl Sandburg Prize. He has two poetry texts forthcoming in 2021. Similarly, a volume of new and selected works and train music, a collaboration with the painter Judith Margalis. Giscom teaches at the University of California, Berkeley, and is a long distance cyclist. Nathaniel Mackey is the author of six books of poetry, most recently Blue Fossa. His honors include the National Book Award for Poetry, the Stephen Henderson Award from the African American Literature and Culture Society, a Guggenheim Fellowship, the Ruth Lilly Poetry Prize from the Poetry Foundation, and the Belingen Prize for American Poetry from the Bunnicki Library at Yale University. Double Trio, a box set of three new books of poetry, is forthcoming from New Directions in 2021. Mackey is the Reynolds Price Distinguished Professor of Creative Writing at Duke University.
I, hello, I believe I'm to go first. I'm. Uh, thank you, thank you all for, thank you all for being in attendance. Thank you, Jari. Thank you to Kave Kanan and to uh, AW, AWP. Um, I'm Cecil Giscom. I am a black man of a certain age. My hair and beard are uh, gray, I think. Um, my shirt is green. My necktie is uh, my necktie is red, and I have a a cycling mirror attached in reverse uh, fashion to my uh, to my eyeglasses. I'm going to read from a poetry book in progress called Negro Mountain. The book is arranged into seven sections, six of which are more or less uh, more or less complete. The summit of Negro Mountain uh, in the Allegheny Mountains is the highest point in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Its name commemorates an 18th century incident in which a black servant or slave, one doesn't know which one, gave his life to protect that of his owner or employer during a skirmish with Native Americans on the mountain ridge that has been called Negro Mountain since that, since that time. I lived in central Pennsylvania for several years. I taught at Penn State. I've been to Negro Mountain. I'll read first from the second section of the book, a section called The Negro Mountains. The titles of poems refer to Pennsylvania mountain places, except for the first poem, The Blue Mountains. The Blue Mountains are a range in Northeast Jamaica. It's a place of, of family origins, and I've been to the Blue Mountains. The Blue Mountains. She said, get your bearings. No shape in my gap, not now. From now on, it goes without saying. If this is allied to the Negro character, it's far from original. I'd only get to where we came out of the mountains and hit the sea. And view the old coast too from the road, the route described by its indentations, one bay after another, until the road turned inland again. Civilization is tattered in such, far be it from me ones close to nothing. Something though to the coast. My affection hath an unknown bottom, like the Bay of Portugal, someone else had been made to say. Second poem is called The Endless Mountains. The Endless Mountains could as well be the werewolf mountains. Count some days. The mountains just repel the story with their endlessness. A dusky fellow, could give them enough to not be bothered by them for more. Come nighttime, please. The evening wolf is the necessary wolf. From now on, don't bother me about it. Seven mountains. And she said, it's in God's hands now. Evil is limitless and multiple locations serve. Make a rural cure, doctor. Make a favorable poultice. Mountains itch all over, all the way down. The mountaintops are bare rock in wave-like patterns. There's often as not a fat saddle between the ridges. Who do you think you saw? Second sight, second thought. Apostrophe is wide, uncountable. Mountains, the default tough neighborhood doctor, in fact, haunted. Nothing's enough, count off. Oh, I'm called the Allegheny Plateau. Travel's enigmatic, and we don't have to go to Negro Mountain to see that. Doom being in the details is all there is to know. Sometimes music creeps forward and slows down to nothing like an animal could. The trace is fact, but content, the dull feeling is elsewhere. Forms noise in the bushes, no bottom to the songs, which must be their charm. Such is apparent, obvious. The mountain is a ridge on a plateau. Voices are that noise getting ahead of itself. It had seemed that certainties grounded in repetition, one thing on top of another. The mountains available, anglicize that. What do you travel to, to think about anything? The bear went over the mountain. I said this before, 
Let's be clear, I said then. Let's be clear, love, there's no frame in here. There's nothing but weather on rock. Carol me. Speaker's the werewolf on Negro Mountain, wouldn't you say, doctor? Carol me that. What do you think you saw? Fix that. Note that. The second thing I'll read is sections from the middle of a long poem, also from Negro Mountain, sections from the middle of a long poem called Overlapping Apexes, a poem dedicated to Nate Mackey and my mutual friend, the poet Ed Roberson. This is from Overlapping, Overlapping uh, Apexes. Starts off with a quote from Ed Roberson, Over, Overlapping Apexes. Mr. Roberson, from a 2010 interview. We had set up camp, not realizing we were this close to the volcano. When we were making camp, the air had cleared and we had seen it for the first time. That night we had built lean-tos and had fires. We woke up during the night and the Indians were carrying on. And the one who spoke a little bit of Spanish said that a Jaguar had passed by to get something to drink. Thank goodness he wasn't hungry, only thirsty but there were tracks. The idea was that we were sharing the night together. The jaguar had passed through the camp. So the image is that the jaguar is there, but you don't see him. Okay, and the poem after that, or the excerpt. Like all of us in the family, a persistent cough, throat clearing from the beginning. Tiger, tiger, first poem, never die. Love gets beyond itself, even in diffusion, in fluidity. Look at me. A Negro gentleman at work in his garden, or on the stage, an actor, or in the club car, the lead service attendant, in the New Yorker, late under lamplight in his office on Home Avenue, in the alley on the street in Bronzeville, at the bottom of the stairs, reciting for his child. What did I know? Ask it twice. The fox just endures the trap. She or he endures being the trap and being the fox, both. For me, gents, it's cats and dogs. Of the states, 21st century Arizona's near worst in terms of trespass. Entre perro y lobo, Spanish for between dog and wolf. Revelation comes in stages to the one on trail. No parable there, sir. Twilight's just the base for darkness. Call God's name, say you're his friend. Photos of jaguars, one an iconic image began to crop up in the Arizona newspapers, 1996, 2009, video in 2016. Jaguars in the backyard, navigation skills beside the point. I never came back from anywhere, your speaker writes. This is California, the real McCoy. Strange cats began to drift over the border, wander into town. Borges said, I imagined my God confiding his message to the living skin of the jaguars who would love and reproduce without end in caverns and cane fields on islands in order that the last men might receive it. I imagined that net of tigers, that teeming labyrinth of tigers inflicting horror upon pastures and flocks in order to perpetuate a design. This was in the story. What I knew about shape, water from a faucet, water in a bowl, jouncy hindquarters down the hill. Shape, don't. Don't say a single thing. Love's instinct though, love devours you. Love's got no animal, even if it's supposed to have one or some. Some of them are one animal, which would speak or loom either one or all of them. Ed Roberson has opined on the nature of my West Indian stutter. The idea that the shaman was a jaguar, or at least a spotted predator. Or go on and shift the shape, divinity, interruption itself, to waiting, no wisdom coming or offered. To wait on someone who wears meaning 
you can see or almost see. A gentleman wears a jacket because the jacket rule applies. Do you wish to be served? An ordinary Negro gentleman in a jacket. The shoulder of South America just hunches along the Atlantic. Demerara sugar. We, your speaker's people, were also from around the great house above the bay. Homeborn slaves, we were native. It's a short walk over the mountains. Broadgate at the foot of the mountain, stony hill, rich, constant spring. In Saint Elizabeth, down by Treasure Beach, people say the crocodiles bark to lure dogs to their doom. Sangay volcanoes 77 hours by car from Paramaribo or Parbo, formerly Port Willoughby. Sometimes it's too hot to sleep. Ed said that he could see sentences within sentences. Dogs and crocodiles were thought to share a language. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Cecil. Um, great to hear you again and to see you again. Um, I'm Nathaniel Mackey, um, black man, 73 years old, wearing wire rim glasses, dreadlocks, gray dreadlocks, gray goatee. I'm going to be reading something that I wrote for um, as a kind of keynote for the Black Poetry Conference that took place at Princeton uh, two years ago. Um, I had been an undergrad there. I was an undergrad there. And as it turned out, uh, this, the, uh, the conference took place exactly uh, 50 years uh, um, to my, my senior year, 50, it had been 50 years prior. So um, I was reminded of the fact that I listened a lot that year to Charles Mingus's album, The Black Saint and the Sinner Lady. And that it was one of the things that provoked me to think about the possibilities of uh, longer poems. And so the piece I'm reading from is a piece on seriality, the serial poem, which has come to be the vein in which I work. And um, it's called A Long Song Log, 10 Entries on Seriality to the Accompaniment of Charles Mingus's Black Saint. The long song is a, a term I borrow from uh, Cecil's work uh, to speak about the serial poem that, uh, and poetics that I've been involved in all these years. From now on, everything I do is gonna be serial, I said at some point, albeit point, pointillism, had gone out into aerial disarray the moment I said it. Was it when Danny Richmond's bass drum to snare drum to sock cymbal figure, suggestive of two tempos other than its own, gathered and began again for the, million, for the millionth time, as I put Mingus's The Black Saint and The Sinner Lady on the box, yet again, right here on this campus 50 years ago. Point, pointillism, punctuation, wanted to go out, go on. Seriality, it said, allows you to begin again, not to begin only once. It allows you also to begin only once, it said, not to begin again, but to resume, to continue. Seriality allows you not to stop. It was beginning to be about time, Black Saint said, and beginning was to be about time. From now on, I said at some point, everything I do is gonna be serial. Was it when the low brass dredged, dredged up graveyard dirt, when bones lined out a sense or a sound of heave or of hall, what Baraka heard in Shep's horn, the weight of blackness? Point asked me if weight was the recursive loop some had been calling history. Weight boomeranging yet again, as it now boomerangs yet again, our world historical hurt. 
If so, it said, seriality is the progressive, non-progressive mnemonic we resort to to remind ourselves, inure and inoculate ourselves. A homeopathic vamp till ready, a sigh, a nomadic not yet. From now on, everything I do is gonna be serial, I said at some point. Point, bleeding outward, elsewhere, whispered from afar, but even so, audibly. Seriality is futurity's ghost come back to haunt. Point plotted with curvature to give time a there before it got there aspect, a not all there but ever, a not all there but never not there aspect, a sense of untimely expense hesitation, anticipation, which is nothing if not what seriality is. Seriality is having something somewhere to come back to, a kind of home, a close thing to it. Point said we were creatures of time, but could we grab hold of it, wield it, swing it? It was something Futurity's ghost had said. From now on, everything I do, I said at some point, is gonna be serial implicitly allowing and aligning serial with funky. Black saints recourse to work song form and sonority saying something about bodily expenditures waft. Honky tonk hermeneutics getting at something about garter belt musk, something about the ongoingness of work and desire. Lee Dorsey, I, was, I assumed, would approve. Was it Quentin Jackson's trombone claps atop Danny Richmond's bass drum to snare drum to sock cymbal figure that affected this alignment of e or equation at the album's outset? Was it when gray was the color of her dress, then white cotton in class of 1938 Hall that a taste for thirst itself set in? Seriality's disavowal of quench or its adherence to an iterative quench. Was it when I knew and was this when I knew I was hearing silly seriality say it would go my bond? Was it then that a vow not to anesthetize desire took root? At some, mode, at some point I said, from now on, everything I do is gonna be serial. Seriality said, abide with me. Seriality took me aside, calling Mingus an avatar of underness and of what would repeatedly be brought up. I caught point wondering, did it all have to do with it? Was it all of it? Did anything, if it was true, form was never more than an extension of content, extend content more than serial form? Point as well wondered, asking out loud, what needed extended, what needed extending more than the lyric, the beleaguered lyric? Call it the long song, the extended lyric, Black Saint said, the extended, extenuated lyric. Say it again, said, say it again. From now on, everything I do is gonna be serial, I said at some point. Point said I was like a ghost, latter-day Futurity's ghost, haunting the past, as in Moo, 82nd part. They were Mrs. Vex and Mr. Fret, but on the box, me and Mrs. Jones. 1972, it might have been. The Black Saint and the Center Lady followed, solo dancer. Time leaned in, no matter when it might have been. 1963, it might have been. Swank refrain said to have been about sex, bodily blare, lyricless though it was, nonetheless. Nonsense, the name it got, otherwise wordless, ban, say nothing, or it all amount to nothing, punctual, only punctual, nothing, add up. The all but point of origin, or the point of all but origin, Black Saint was. Mingus himself had warned, you don't play the beat where it is, you draw a picture away from the beat. You tease the mind by not telling exactly what everyone knows, where one, two, three, and four are. Away from found it no polis we knew, the opposition of church to state Mingus's nerve church, nerve churchicality chanting history down. From now on, everything I do is gonna be serial, I said at some point. 
Was it when Mingus took a station break during his liner notes? At this moment, I'd like to pause for station identification, station soul and love. Charles Mariano lead alto and alto solos. Jerome Richardson lead, read baritone, flute, soprano, and baritone solos coming to you through some of these same above stated frequencies, plus moral support to yours truly. Was it knowing not everyone wanted to know what love was, what soul was that did it? We would forever be identifying our station as the dial drifted and we played beset by static. Seriality point put in is an advance of parts leaning on one another, mutually supporting, wanting to say what would not be known otherwise, otherwise not be known, an interplay of parts. Was it that taken with Mingus's lush night on the town romanticism, his erotic elegiac romanticism, a knowing romantic toss and return, one knew would never be done one new one would never be done putting, being put through love's paces, by which time one seemed even to oneself to be point personified. Point said I was, I was a phased epi, epiphanous ghost visiting the future in Mu, 230th part. Her black saint I'd be, the two of us abed in black sheets, black satin, Satanic accents never not near. Seriality, Black Saint said, is the interrogated lyric striking back, a suspect bitter sweetness taking its time. Say it again, said, say it again. From now on, I said at some point, everything I do is going to be serial. Point preceded but found support in C.S. Giscom's Giscom Road, whose long song is a bridge of horns, a commotion without words about the contempt for arrival, all about the taste for arrival, a mixed emotional road song, a ridden song, a song of transit. The long song pursues, but only ostensibly pursues, pursues arrival eschewing arrival, a dissident song, disavowing arrival, as if black to say, sizing up the new world, look at where arrival got us. Even Columbus in Kamal Brathwaite's extended, extenuated lyric, his long song, The Arrivance, is given pause. Columbus from his after deck saw bearded pig, fig trees, yellow pooies, blazed like pollen and thin waterfalls suspended in the green as his eyes climbed towards the highest ridges where our farms were hidden. Now he was sure he heard soft voices mocking in the leaves. What did this journey mean? This new world mean? Discovery or a return to terrors he had sailed from, known before? The long song is seriality's far side, seriality's dream of wholeness deferred, the blue topic interanimation of wonder and rue that Giscom says, edges in and in it I'd shout. The long song's nameless though, an invisible this or this loomed among the trees as it repeated. It crawled and rued its day and crawled and came repeatedly to its own lips, ruining its day. The return to the sights was not sweet. Back out was not familiar sounding the second time through or the third. The return was, re was aloof itself. Point felt itself apart from itself. It recognized a holding of arrivals repeat at arm's length, a being off to the side. Point preceded Giscom, but followed Mingus when Robert Kelly said, fashion teaches brevity, but brevity, he was sorry to say, is a lie. I must be longer with this music. Another way of saying, as I had at some point, from now on, everything I do is gonna be serial. 
still point wanted to say or know without words, why? Why nameless? There's a music I answered, a long song, an extended, extenuated lyric that's beyond rendering, rending, rendition. Seriality chases it. Thank you. Truly amazing, Nate, Cecil. It's such a pleasure to be here with you both. Um, so to get things started, in regards to legacy, who were early influences for you both as literary artists? Who remains a present inspiration to you all after all this time? I can respond a little bit, a little bit to that. Um, and oh, where are my notes? Right here. I would first of all thank, and this this is this is sort of by way of, of responding to your to your question. And uh, my thanks for including myself and uh, and Kemal Brathwaite in the same in the same paragraph, Nate. That was uh, important. And I'll, I'll, I'll mention that in a, in a second. In regards to influences and so forth, uh, there are obviously for me so many, you know, as to be, as to be almost, almost uncountable. You know, I'm old, right? And, I, and I, look, I look back on a lot, of, a, a lot of years. I'm drawn today to two, in response to your question, to two library moments. Um, and the first, accidental discoveries, both of them, the first being Langston Hughes when I was 13 or 14 at the Dayton, Ohio Public Library. I read a poem called uh, Who But the Lord, uh, the poem beginning, I saw that man they called the law, he was coming down the street at me. And it goes on, goes on from there. You know, 13, 14 years old, I thought, oh, okay, yes. And the second, uh, and years later in my 30s, I found a book called X Self by Kemal Brathwaite. Mm -hmm. um, when I was on the Commonwealth floor of the Olin Library at Cornell, uh, and with the, with the picture of Columbus on the uh, uh, on the cover, I'd never heard of Kemal Brathwaite before before then, or Langston Hughes the first time, and both books changed absolutely everything, you know, for me. I would also be um, I would also you know want to nod, especially this week, uh, to Lawrence Ferlinghetti who died last week, uh, Coney Island of the Mind, which I read in, uh, in high school, at Progressive Catholic High School. And we read, or not us, but the kids in next grade read, uh, read that and they passed it on, on down to us, and to me in the cafeteria. And I would also nod to, uh, in the eighties, uh, someone else who's no longer with us, Leslie Scalapino, a great, great writer uh, who, who died much too much too young and uh, and and recently and to also in memoriam uh, Shirley Ann Williams who I had the good fortune the good fortune to meet uh, letters letters from a New England Negro some one sweet angel child uh, were amazing uh, amazing books awesome well I I um, I can go back to and should go back to um, a library moment as well, which was um, when I was a teenager and in high school, uh, I used to go to the public library on occasion to uh, look up stuff for my homework. And um, this was in uh, uh, 63 or something like that. And I um, went in one evening and I always checked out the new arrivals rack and one of the books that was in the New Arrivals rack was a book by William Carlos Williams called Pictures from Bruegel. And I was um, uh, intrigued by and attracted to the name, uh, William Carlos Williams. Um, you know, the repeat of William and then this, um, I mean, quintessential, um, you know, English, I guess. And in between is this Hispanic name uh, Carlos. So um, that led me to pick the book up and start thumbing through it. And um, I ended up checking it out, taking it home. 
and uh, starting to read it. And that was really my introduction to um, contemporary poetry, modern poetry. And um, I, was quite, um, I was quite taken with it. Uh, around the same time, um, another poet from New Jersey uh, came into um, my life. Um, I was listening to uh, jazz a lot then and um, learning about different jazz musicians and uh, John Coltrane was one of them. Um, I've been introduced to him uh, by listening to Miles Davis's albums. And um, I think the first album of his that I bought was uh, called Coltrane Live at Birdland. Mm. And it um, has liner notes written by uh, Amiri Baraka, mm. who was Leroy Jones at that time. And um, I was, um, the music and, uh, you know, blew me away. The liner notes blew me away. And um, there were, you know, Jones was identified as a poet. So I went out and checked out um, his, the dead lecturer. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that became um, kind of a Bible for me. So those two were the start of it. And um, they led me to other, too numerous to, you know, to name um, influences um, just from their mentionings and, um, you know, poets in the, um, what's been called the Pound Williams line uh, mm -hmm. would come into my reading, um, you know, HD, um, po poets in the, the Black Mountain line that Baraka at that time was associated with, Robert Duncan and Denise Levertov, Robert, uh, Robert Creeley, uh, Charles Olson, um, you know, mentioned by both of them of Lorca, took me there. Um, the Negritude poets, um, South American poets such as Vallejo and, and Neruda. Um, the Caribbean came into it uh, later uh, with um, uh, my, my happening upon uh, Kamal Brathwaite's The Arrivance, which I just mentioned in this piece um, in 74 when it came out in, um, um, I've forgotten what the bookshop's name was, what the bookstore's name was called in Berkeley, but um, I'd been reading Olson talking about history and the poet. And here was a poet from the Caribbean who was a, a historian and that interested me. So I started reading him and he became a really, uh, you know, central figure for me. Uh, Wilson Harris, another Caribbean writer, um, the possibilities of poetry and prose that his novels disclosed uh, mm -hmm. has never left me. Um, back earlier, there had been uh, the prose of uh, uh, Juna Barnes and Nightwood, that, that, that novel that uh, still is a bright light, you know, you know for me. So um, there are some beginnings and some inklings of you know, this constellation of figures that have come to be uh, influential for me. Right on, right on. Um, you both mentioned a couple of luminaries of mine. Um, definitely Langston Hughes uh, and John Coltrane. Um, that was how I got a lot of my early poetry written. So <laughs> definitely can relate. Um, so moving on, you two have known each other for quite some time. How have you each been a part of each other's journey as artists? Well, um, Cecil, how did we meet? You were at um, Cornell running a reading series, series and, and uh, editing, uh, what's the journal at Cornell called? Uh, Epoch, E-P-O-C-H. Yeah, Epoch. And uh, I think you invited me out to give a reading at Cornell. Uh, I think we had corresponded a bit before that and, um, and that's how we, we met. And, We've been in touch in one way or another ever since. And I've forgotten what year that was, but sounds like it would have been the 80s, maybe? 90s? That, that was the 80s. 80s, yeah. yeah. I, I, had, I had the you know the good fortune to be, you know, to be in touch with you. I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of overlap here uh, as you talk about as you talk about Olson uh, and uh, and the black, the Black Mountain poets. Uh, you mentioned uh, 
you mentioned Robert Kelly at some at some point in in there as well. And interestingly, the long song is actually it's a it's a it's from a correspondence that Kelly and I had in the in the nineteen nineteen eighties. Uh, the long song. So, I've, you know, I've added another long to it. A long, long song, which is you know, <laughs> certainly certainly seriality. Uh, but I was the editor of Epic Magazine of the 1980s, uh, running a reading series. Not really, not until you came. You were the inaugural poet in my reading series. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Oh, yeah, yeah. You were the. I, re I recall the poster we uh, we made we made for you, uh, okay. the epic the epic reading series, and you were kind enough, you know, to send me uh, to send me work for the for the journal the journal as well. And I remember that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and um, am I misremembering or, or did the reading take place in something called the Jupiter Room? It took place in the Temple of Zeus. The Temple of Zeus, okay. I, I, I knew there was a Greek god that was presiding over the reading, yeah. uh, looking over my shoulder and making me feel very uncomfortable. Statues, old, <laughs> old plaster, or replicas of, of plaster. plaster. Yeah, Statue. yeah, but, uh, yeah. but we, got, we got through it, we got by. We did, we did. And, yeah. and um, and I've, I've had the, the honor of, of uh, publishing uh, Cecil's work uh, on, I think, more than one occasion in Hambone. Yes. So uh, he's, he's got his uh, Hambonista uh, ID card in his wallet. Um, and uh, he, he shows it proudly whenever he, he stopped by the highway patrol or, you know, he has to cross the border. <laughs> you know. yeah. Which happens more often than I would have, I would have imagined at this, uh, at well, this that, point. Yeah, well, story. well, see, or yeah. the UW that's, what they, that's what they do. That's what they do. They start, they pull you over. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. Wow. Such a, such a rich legacy between the two of you. It's, it's really uh, beautiful to, to witness. Um, speaking of, of Handball Mackey, uh, what was the inception or inspiration for the literary journal Handball? Uh, how has it been curating this artistic archive over all these years? Well, it actually started under another name. Um, was started under another name by some people at Stanford when I was in uh, grad school there. And um, the, uh, the person who uh, was in charge of it uh, left uh, to take a job elsewhere. And, um, and Al Young, uh, who was teaching at Stanford at the time, um, recommended to them that they um, uh, turn it over to me. And so, um, that was the uh, first issue. I had some material that they had collected and um, um, some points from, I think, um, uh, Michael Harper and others, uh, some grad students there at Stanford. Uh, I had a, a Gerald Barax with somebody uh, who I wanted to get in there. So I wrote him and got some points from him. I had heard an interview with Anthony Braxton on uh, the Berkeley station KPFA that I liked. And so I, uh, I got permission to transcribe that and publish it. Anyway, there was that first issue that came out in spring of 1974. And then I left uh, in um, um, the fall of 74 to, to take a job at University of Wisconsin. So, but nobody continued it. And, um, and then I, I wanted to continue it at some point, and I did in 1982, and uh, kept the name Hambone, different format, and really a different magazine in some ways, uh, but some strains uh, connecting it um, with the first issue. And um, it was a way for me to um, stay in touch and get in touch with people whose work at, 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 at um, you know, it caught my attention and meant something to me. It was a way of, to create a kind of community and um, beyond my immediate poetic community. And um, it's, you know, um, been a valuable uh, instrument for doing that uh, over the years. Awesome. Yeah, in the description, um, I remember reading something about how Hambone was kind of like a, a means of mapping for you in, in some ways as well. Um, mm -hmm. So it's really interesting um, that you also got to publish uh, Cecil here, um, mm -hmm. which is really dope. Um, so Cecil, uh, you've done extensive work 
map uh, involving mapping geography and location amid Black Appalachia and beyond. Um, where have those maps, routes, or roads led you? Uh, that led me to some strange, strange places, and I'll, I'll just, you know, the coattails of the, of the question to Nate about Hambone. I'll mention that uh, one of the one of the things that Nate published in in Hambone did require a map that be spread across across two across two pages. I was surprised <laughs> that you were willing to do that, and I was very, I was very pleased uh, with uh, with that. Um, and so everything you said about community. Is very much to the very much to the uh, to the point, but the the maps that I'm that I've worked I've worked with, and there are a bunch of maps. Uh, maps lead you into social into social settings, right? Uh, unanticipated social settings. Uh, geography is far afield from where I thought I was from where I thought I was going. So you start in one in one place, and then you you end up you end up someplace. Uh, or places rather, you know, men mm -hmm. very, very, you know, very different. There's no pure place to capture or arrive at. There's always and only and only something, you know, something unexpected. The mm -hmm. writing about Pennsylvania that I'm doing, I'm doing now in, in Negro Mountain, um, has led me, you know, quote unquote, back to, you know, back to Jamaica and to, and to Mississippi, uh, mm -hmm. where I or I had not expected, I had not expected to go, and into some strange houses, uh, literally strange, strange houses. What am I doing in this, in this woman's, in this woman's house? Uh, <laughs> being ignored. It's a, it's, that's another story. Uh, and I, I, you know, thinking about, thinking about the question, I thought about the, um, I remembered something that John Ashbery had said once. He said, uh, an idea I had and thought about became the things I do. Mm -hmm. And I was, I was, yeah, that's, that stayed, that stayed with me. Yeah, I appreciate um, the writings of, uh, you know, Black Appalachian Negro Mountain. I lived in Pittsburgh for like three years and had never heard of this mountain. So thank you for that. You put me on. So I really appreciate that. Uh, <laughs> there's, there's a certain amount of, obviously a certain amount of, of controversy and much to, and much to think about yeah. uh, in terms of, in terms of the naming of the mountain and in terms of the location of the of the mountain, right? Cecil, do you ever think of that in terms of uh, of Hughes's uh, essay, um, the, the the Negro Mount writer and the racial mountain? Yeah. Yes, I do, and it's that's that's in the book, in in some in some pieces. It has mm -hmm. to. I mean, it has to be right. It's, well, yeah, I mean, it's there. Yeah, I would think. Yes. Right. <laughs> awesome. Um, so this, this next question is, is centered around community uh, in, in a particular way. Um, so thinking about the Black poets of my generation and younger, so much of our work is still held to the standard of institutions that perform tactics of gatekeeping. Institutions that claim they value our lives and work summed up in a single paragraph. We are all still beholden to a continued Eurocentric notion of traditional and formal convention of poetry despite the increased presence of Black and Black LGBTQ identified writers within the landscape. I'm really curious to know how each of you have resisted such pressures and how each of you have invested in the experimental poetic work via a Black aesthetic um, and how that's impacted your writing and pedagogical lives. Um. There are a couple of things I would say in response to that, one of which is just, just a, there's a brief story and it goes back to my, my early days, very early, the second year, I think, as a graduate student at, at Cornell, and I was teaching a course called Writing from Experience, which I actually taught for 25 years after, after that. And, um, and I, was, I was damned by a course leader in my mm -hmm. first year of teaching, a mm -hmm. faculty member for encouraging my students in, my, in that freshman comp class to compose work that was, as he said, pornographic, that encouraged sexual schizophrenia. And, wow. uh, and then he let me know about the worst damnation. The worst thing that I was doing, of course, was that I was encouraging them to be postmodern. Hmm. Now, I was, I was a kid. I didn't know what postmodern meant that afternoon, but I, uh, I found out and it's kept me in trouble you know, ever since. 
you know, from this day, mm -hmm. from that day uh, to, uh, uh, to, to this one. Um, I would be, eh, Cornell stories. I'd be remiss if I, if I did not mention something very, you know, very important, important to me. Uh, and that is the expanding the repertoire event organized by, which Nate, you'll, you'll remember that. Oh yeah, by, yeah. By, uh, by Giovanni Singleton and Renee Gladman at uh, the old New College in Valencia Street in San Francisco. And I believe it was 1999. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I'd, I'd already been in trouble in various, various places for, you know, for, uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of my, you know, my attitudes about, um, about, about work and uh, about what was, you know, what was good what constituted, you know, work that was worth was worth thinking about, uh, boundaries and so forth across across the sort of boundaries that I think you're talking about. Um, but this was a conference for Black quote unquote difficult writers, and I like the term difficult more than I like the term postmodern, yeah, whatever that means, and exper and experimental. Difficult because I hear in that word difficult, I hear I hear a certain Black vernacular. You know, you're being difficult. Stop being difficult. I've heard that. You know, not at Cornell or not at Berkeley, <laughs> but I've heard it. I've heard it in my life. Okay, right. and, <laughs> and I like. You know, I like that. I like that very much. Uh, but that you know, there's several days at New College in San Francisco. I was able to walk the streets, and San Francisco was a very different town in those in those days. This twenty you know twenty years ago. You know than it is than it is now. I was able to walk around with Nate, and with um, who I think I'd, I'd I'd met you I'd met you before that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, walk around with Nate and with Wanda Coleman, the late Wanda Coleman, who I'd also been able to able to publish and got in trouble for doing, in the uh, and um, and with Harriet Mullen and Mark mm -hmm. Morris and Will Alexander, and of course Giovanni, uh, who's a dear friend still. And Renee Gladman, who's a dear friend still, as uh, you know, as well, seeing each other, being in each other's physical physical company, um, you know, and Erica Hunt, for God's sake, don't forget Erica Hunt, uh, you know, laughing together, was you know one of the one of the key, you know, events. Um, you know, reading's different. Reading's good. This was something. This was something else. Um, one, one of the key events of, of my, you know. Of, uh, of that kind of long moment in my uh, in my in my life and in and in my work. Well, I think you know my experience was that you know one one had to um, um, create counter institutions, you know, to the extent possible. Um, you know, uh, setting up reading series. Uh, you know, journals of one's own, that kind of thing. Um, while also, um, you know, pressuring the institution that one was in to, you know, to expand, you know, to open up. Um, when I was at Princeton in the uh, late 60s, in the English department, the only uh, Black author taught was uh, Ralph Ellison, and that was in an introduction to American literature class. So um, a group of us, you know, petitioned for there to be a, um, a class in African American literature, and um, and we got a response, which was that there was a, a class in African American literature that was taught by a woman uh, who, who came down from Rutgers, C Cecilia Drury. Uh, to teach the class, and and that class was my introduction to a lot of stuff. Uh, Tumors Kane, for example, um, as it turned out, she was a friend of Ishmael Reed's, and his first book had just come out, and and he came down to visit the class. Um, you know, so that's you know that's one of the things you do. Um, I had a a friend there. Um, named Daryl Johnson. And we used to talk about getting stuff like that onto the Princeton campus as a kind of smuggling, 
you know, we, we were bringing contraband onto campus, you know, getting, getting you know, Gene Toomer taught in a course, getting Ishmael Reed, you know, to vis visit, uh, things of that sort. He and I um, brought uh, Mary Baraka uh, to the Princeton campus. We brought Sun Ra to the campus. Mm -hmm. So one creates, you know, counter uh, institutions, you know, while, you know, smuggling in, um, you know, uh, stuff into the, you know, the, the existing institutions, um, you know, that, 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 that was not already there. Um, and then there's, you know, what Cecil mentions, there's, there's, there's that in-person sense of, you know, one another as live human beings, laughing and eating food together and talking and stuff like that, that's important. And that's one of the things that those institutions that you create uh, help to make possible. It's also the kind of thing that the gates that you open in those more conventional um, institutions that you happen to be in uh, makes possible. Um, those are just a couple ways, but you know, um, you know that, that's the kind of thing that's you know that 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 has you know been um, important in my experience. Right on. Thank you for that. Um, this this last question that I have uh, is is kind of similar um, in this concentration around community. Um, but I'm curious as to what advice you both might give this generation of Black poets. Um, what are some principles or lessons that continue to inform your relationship to yourselves and your work? Well, mine would be that uh, writing is not a sprint. Mm. You know, I mean, I'm <laughs> the long song. <laughs> you know? And of course, you know, Cecil is a long distance bicycle rider. So he may, he may want to, you know, say something about that, but um, yeah, that, that, I don't know who told me that, you know, but somebody told me that, you know, when I, when I, I was in my twenties. And uh, I think that more than anything else, um, you know, has, 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 uh, has nourished me. And that, that would, that would be the first thing I would offer up to, you know, any, any younger writer, you know, it's, it's, uh, um, it's, it's, it's a long, it's a long distance run. Yeah. yeah I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. I mean, the, uh, it's one of the things I did learn, you know, in graduate, in graduate school from my, from my teachers who have their own, uh, you know, very, you know, varied careers, um, or strange, you know, strange trajectories, getting them to it, to the, to that, you know, to that, that particular point. Yeah, you keep writing, whatever you do, you keep, uh, you keep writing, just get your work, get your work done, you know, spend the, however much time you can, if it's only an hour a day, you spend the hour a day. If you're lucky, you can maybe spend three hours, you know, three hours a day during, if you're lucky enough to get fellowships, apply for those uh, and, and you keep, keep writing. And I would also add, I mean, it's, perhaps it's obvious, but, uh, I'll say it. I'll say it anyway, and that is to read as widely as possible. And um, Nate, you mentioned uh, getting Ishmael Reed uh, down to uh, down to Princeton. His first book had just come out. I wonder. I'm wondering if that was Conjure that you're talking about. No, it was. Um, what was it? The novel, the, the freelance pallbearers. Freelance pallbearers. Okay. Yeah. 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 No, it was Conjure that was that was uh, that was awfully awfully important for me, which came out around the same time, I guess in the late, his first poetry book, I believe, mm -hmm. uh, late, uh, the late 60s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that was a little later, yeah. yeah. And also uh, my discovery, same time, of, uh, of, of Kane as a sophomore, sophomore at, uh, at university. There's, like I said, there's a lot of, uh, there's, a, there's a long, a long, 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 long list, long, long song, long, long list. But yeah, read as widely as possible. And here's something that uh, something else, and that is to cultivate uh, cultivate relationships with other other black writers, even those of differing differing aesthetics. Um, you know, I'm, I'm I'm recalling, you know, my own first visit to the Furious Flower Conference, which 
occurs every every five years, I think, um, down in you know down in Virginia. Uh, lots of people, lots of people go to it. Again, a very differing aesthetics, and I was uh, I was struck by the uh, the you know within with some obvious exceptions the huge fellow feeling, and I mean the word is generosity, the generosity that people that everybody the generous spirit that was absolutely everywhere that I, um, you know, that I, that I saw. Uh, you'll find young, you, young, you young black writers, you'll find, you know, generosity uh, in these conversations and, and most of the time and, and, and edges to the conversation that can't be found, that can't be found anywhere, anywhere else. And that, that stuff strikes me as rather, rather important. I had, my, I had my first black university professor uh, in graduate school, Billy Joe Harris, who some of you some of you know, uh, and, uh, and, and you know, we're still friends. We still we still talk. Beautiful, beautiful. Um, I guess in closing, maybe like you all might have a question for each other um, as we close it out. Um. <laughs> Or final remarks or anything like that. Lisa, how are you doing? Not too bad. <laughs> Long time no see. It's been a, I, I think the last time I saw you was on election night in 2016. Yeah. Which was kind of a bad day. It was not a good time. It was not a good time. No. Um, yeah. So let's forget that. <laughs> <laughs> no, let's never forget that. <laughs> <laughs> or that. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, but other than that, how have you been? You've been okay? I've been, I've, I've, I've been, I've been fair, you know. Okay, okay. I'm healthy. My grandchildren are coming for dinner in, uh, in about, in a few, in a few minutes. So, oh, you know, that's, you know. Oh, you're sitting on top of the world. Yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> no problem, no problem. Well, I can't, I can't tell you enough uh, how honored and blessed um, I've been to sit in on this conversation with you both. It's been such a pleasure and an honor. Um, on behalf of Kaveh Kanem, I would like to thank both Cecil and Nate uh, for their time and their brilliance. Um, a huge thanks to AWP and you all for tuning in. Um, it has been an honor to be in conversation. I hope you all have a wonderful night.